Master Series. I'm your host, Noel Metter, and today's guest is Dr. Daniel Siegel. Dr. Siegel is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the UCLA School of Medicine. He is the founding co-director of the Mindful Awareness Research Center and the executive director of the Mindsight Institute. He is a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, as well as the author of several books on parenting, child development, and well-being, including today's focus, Mindsight, the new science of personal transformation. Dr. Siegel lives in Southern California with his family. Dr. Siegel, welcome to the show. Thank you, Noel. Great to be here. Absolutely. Um, this is a fascinating topic, and I just want to st start by letting our listeners know that what we're going to be focused on is really learning how we can um, improve the mental health, whether we're dealing with anxiety, depression, uh, feelings of shame, inadequacy, mood swings, addiction, PTSD, the, light, the word goes on and on. And I know that you use a frame, uh, the approach is called Mindsight. And the reason I share that kind of off the bat here is that it's probably going to take us a little bit of uh, putting some definition to this before we actually get really practical. So for the listener out there, hang in there with us as we get some of the definition and then we'll get pretty practical in terms of the application. So let me just start with this. Dr. Siegel, can you help us define the mind? Well, that's a great place to start, Noel. You know, the, um, the thing about uh, our lives, whether you've been overseas at war or you're just living the challenges of everyday life, uh, we have this inner experience that we call subjectivity, that is your feelings, your thoughts, the meanings of things in your life. And these things are a part of what's called the mind. So in terms of what that word M-I-N-D means, it means at a minimum, your subjective experience, the feelings you have, the memories you have, the impulses you have, the meanings you have, all that kind of stuff is what we put under mind. And the word mind actually doesn't really have a definition short of brain activity, but brain activity and subjective experience, your feelings, your thoughts are not the same. Hmm. So we want to be clear that what we're about to talk about in terms of mind sight, which is basically seeing the mind, is different from just getting a picture of the brain. And the mind, at a minimum, is about our inner subjective experience. It also includes consciousness, which means how you're aware of something. And it includes something called information processing. So, for example, if you've been in a, a very terrifying experience um, here in the States or you've been overseas, and you've been at war, and a horrifying thing has happened, it can do things to the way you access aspects of memory that when you understand those ways that trauma can impact memory, it totally changes your ability to cope with what's going on and even heal from the trauma. Hmm. So as we dive deeply into defining the mind, which we can do in a moment, we'll see that uh, having this definition of mind gives us new, very practical ideas and applications and tools and skills that can inform us and direct us in doing things that can help our lives and help other people as well. So this is where we'll go with actually the definition I'm about to give you. Yeah, yeah. So when you talk about the mind, are you, are you kind of, in a way, categorizing it with conscious and subconscious? Is that part of it? Yes, absolutely. So the mind at a very minimum has things you're aware of. Mm -hmm. and You can use the word consciousness and awareness as the same meaning. Right. So you can have them in consciousness or be aware of them. You know about them. Like, Noel, you right now, knowing I'm speaking to you, if you're a listener, you know you're hearing Noel and Dan speak. Right. So that sense of being aware, of being conscious, of knowing is what we mean by these terms. Now, much of what goes on in our mental life is information processing that I'll describe in a moment, like connecting one thing to another or having memories for things or emotions even that evaluate the meaning of things. And these are not in awareness. Mm -hmm. So you have this really interesting, absolutely established fact that the mind has a, both, uh, has a level that's both at the level of awareness, which is actually small, Mm -hmm. and a much bigger aspect of the mind that's beneath awareness. Got it. So you just don't know about it, but it still affects you in ways we can describe soon. Yeah. So, so that's the first step is to realize that the mind is more than what you're conscious of. 
That makes sense. Yeah. So when you talk about what is mindsight, is that, is that related to, you know, you hear a lot about mindful, uh, mindfulness meditation. Would, would you say those are one and the same or how are they different? No, well, mindfulness and mindsight are actually different terms. Okay. The word mindsight is a term I made up back around 1981. I had dropped out of medical school. The professors I had didn't really see the mind of their uh, patients. So like, let's say a patient had been in a car accident, a horrible car accident. They would just deal with the physical effects on their body not their feelings or their memories or the impact on how their mind functions with the focus of attention, their distractibility, their relationships. None of that was the focus of what my professors were doing. So I ended up stopping school because I had been trained as a biochemistry major to study molecules and I knew how to do that. But I had also been trained to work on a suicide prevention service. Hmm. And I knew that the way you tune into the inner mental life the feelings, the sense of despair of someone in a suicidal crisis yeah. could make the difference between whether they chose to kill themselves or chose to live. So for me, tuning in to the internal subjective experience of another person, what I ended up calling mind sight, was crucial in medicine. So I stopped and when I went back to medical school, I studied how the professors that didn't use mind sight with their patients actually didn't have such effective ways of providing medical care, whereas those that did offer empathic comments and had insight into themselves, so those are two fundamental aspects of mindsight, insight into oneself, empathy for the inner reality of another person. When it's present, it actually helps in a relationship. Hmm. So mindsight is insight into yourself, empathy for the mental experience of someone else, and a third thing, which is called integration. And integration is basically how separate aspects of something are linked together. And that comes from defining the mind um, as a process which is called self-organization. And that's a little complex, it's a mathematical term, but basically it's if you think about a choir, a choir when it sings in harmony is integrated. It's differentiating its singers and linking them. And a harmony is the quality we want to have with a healthy life. Whereas when life isn't going so well, it goes to either rigidity on the one hand, things are stuck, completely predictable, unmoving, um, or it goes to chaos where people th th things are random and completely unpredictable, they flood you. So amazingly, the science of self-organization in what's called complex systems theory, you don't need to worry about that, but it <laughs> comes from science, the bottom line is, I think the mind beyond consciousness and non-conscious information processing, beyond subjective experience, is yet another process on top of those important processes, and that's called self-organization. Hmm. And what, what that allows us to do is ask, what is a healthy mind? So the proposal back in the, in the um, uh, early 90s was the idea that the mind is a self-organizing process. And what is it doing? It's regulating energy and information flow. And when that flow is going to be healthy, it's differentiating linking, let's call mm -hmm. that integration. Mm -hmm. And when you block either differentiation or linkage, then you go to either chaos or rigidity. And so far, every study that's ever been done, say for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, the difficulty with the life of a person with unresolved trauma is they have chaos and rigidity. Chaos would be experienced, for example, as flooded, I'm being flooded with memories. I'm being flooded with a sense of panic. I have these unpredictable senses of anxiety that come up. So that's the chaotic part of it. Yeah. The rigid yeah. part could be, I refuse to go to the airport. I don't want to be near any airplanes. Let's say I was in an airplane uh, accident. Or uh, I just rigidly withdraw from social interactions from people and I'm glum and depressed and demoralized. So those would be the ways of thinking about one person, me, with unresolved trauma, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, would have both chaos and rigidity. And if you did a scan of my brain, you'd actually find that 
areas that are usually linking differentiated parts, so allowing integration to be present, are actually either blocked in their functioning or even they've shrunken a bit from the trauma. Mm. Wow. So treatments that work are treatments that actually promote integration. So this is where the bottom line, this is from a long time ago, 25 years ago, but the suggestion is health comes from integration. Impaired integration leads to various manifestations of unhealth. So even if we've experienced a trauma, you know, in a car accident here at home, in a horrible accident on the battlefield uh, overseas, um, we can have unresolved traumatic states, which mean we have impaired integration in our lives, including our brains, but also in our relationships, mm. not honoring differences and promoting linkages, even relationally, because the mind is not just in the head. In our view, in this field I work in, um, we see the mind as both fully embodied and fully relational. Mm -hmm. And as a self-organizing process, it creates health by fostering differentiation and linkage, which is impaired in trauma and a lot of other disorders too so far every disorder that's been studied integration is also impaired so psychotherapy in general even if you haven't been traumatized would be to try to detect the chaos or rigidity that are your symptoms of whatever challenge you're facing whether it's depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder or an eating disorder or, or whatever and try to promote well-being mm -hmm. that's the idea yeah well, I got to say, in the last 10 minutes, I got more of an education than my four years of going through college. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> this stuff is so fascinating to me. Uh -huh. And I just wonder, you know, that, I mean, you did a great job giving us some definition. I'm, I'm thinking some of our audience might want to, is there like a case study where you could take some of these like examples of what you're talking about and put it into more a narrative of a story? Sure, I'd be happy to. And now you have the framework like yeah. you suggested. You it's know. really fascinating. When I was starting my residency in psychiatry at UCLA, I worked at the Veterans Administration Hospital. And when I became the chief resident, I was the chief resident uh, over all the hospitals, but including the VA hospital. So in those days, back in, in the 80s, you know, the, the uh, veterans had come, uh, many of them from the Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll give you one example of um, a wonderful person I worked with uh, as a resident um, that made me really ask my supervisors, you know, what is going on with post-traumatic stress disorder? And in those days, they actually didn't know. So they would say to me, I don't know, which didn't make me feel very comfortable. So <laughs> I, would, I, I went on a deep search to try to put together a framework and people weren't doing it in those days. It was before, before the decade of the brain. They weren't doing it much. But I went into neuroscience studies to try to understand how is memory and narrative, the stories we tell, memory, the things we recall, how are they mediated in the brain? And then how could this fit into a larger picture of what the mind was? And then the specific picture of how do people, let's say, who are part of the military forces who come back, and, uh, you know, uh, our, this person was a Marine, you know, uh, uh, deal with the overwhelming experiences they have. Mm -hmm. So um, I was on the ward um, and um, uh, this fellow uh, who I was taking care of um, was on the had, had just we just admitted him and he had become very despondent. He, he was not acutely suicidal, but he was thinking of not living, but mm -hmm. he came to the um, VA hospital and he was hospitalized. Um, during the first week of his evaluation, one day he, I went into his room to go get him for a therapy session and he pulled me down uh, on the floor uh, and, and he had a broom for me and we were down underneath this um, cot in the, in the, the room, in his hospital room. Um, and uh, his look on his face was as if he was facing people who were about to kill him. Mm -hmm. And he pulled me down, and we were both down there with these brooms, you know, um, getting ready for the enemy to come and, and get us. And, um, you know, you could say, oh, he's play acting, he's just making this up, he wants to stay in the hospital longer. But I, I can tell you, being down there on the ground with him under that cot, 
it did not feel like that. It yeah, felt yeah. very terrifying. And um, he was as if he were back in Vietnam, as if people were there uh, in the jungle trying to shoot him. Uh, luckily, I was not the enemy and I was his, his <laughs> compatriot. And, you know, through the course of that, what would be called a flashback, um, you could see the absolute terror, the helplessness he felt the horrible things he was seeing that I won't go into detail here, but you can imagine people being killed around him and right. particular one person who was his close friend and the things that happened to his body that were experienced in graphic detail through his eyes, through his smell, through his ears, through all the senses of a horrible, horrible death of his friend. And, um, you know, in the course of that, for myself as a resident, I didn't know what in the world was going on. But I went along with the with the journey, and you know, o over time he just got exhausted and collapsed. I put him in bed, came out. The nurses, you know, uh, were very concerned about everything that had gone on. Um, I want to just focus on this one particular yeah. episode, just to give you an example sure. of why looking at uh, uh, the mind is so important. So there, you can see something happened in a human being in the United States on the mainland, uh, as if he were back in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And the experience was as if it were happening in the present moment, but it wasn't. So how can we explain that? This person is not crazy. Mm -hmm. This person is having a disturbance of memory function um, such that the reactivation of a configuration of memory representations of being in Vietnam in his brain, let's stay with the brain for a moment, um, are being activated and they're not tagged with saying, this is coming from the past, my friend. This is a memory you're recalling. Mm -hmm. He's reliving it. So mm -hmm. how do we explain that? Well, it turns out that there are two layers of memory. Um, one is a layer called implicit memory. The other is a layer called explicit memory. And they are layers because the first layer to be what's called encoded is that you have an experience, let's say what you see or what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch, through your five senses. You even have what you feel inside your body, your heart pounding, your breathing fast, your intestines churning. And you can even have your thoughts and emotions. All of these can be embedded within what's called implicit memory. Yeah. yeah. Then what happens is you can take these implicit memories and they're at this first layer. And if you're, if they're in their pure form, it turns out and you retrieve them. So encoding happens at first, that's the firing of the neurons when an event is happening. You then store those configurations in the brain. And then if there's a cue, something happens that reminds you of a similar setting, you can reactivate those neural firing patterns. Here's the secret that no one seems to, realize, even though we've known it for many years, pure implicit memory, when it's retrieved from storage, has no tagging of being from the past. Wow. Yeah. So it can just feel very alive. It's in the present moment. Mm -hmm. It's your vision. It's your smell. It's your hearing. It's your taste. It's your touch. This has been proven. Hmm. Now, you can say, well, why aren't we always flooded like that? Because here's what happens often. You have a second layer um, of memory that's being processed by an area of the brain called the hippocampus. It's an area that is in the center of the brain in the limbic region. It, it, so if you take your, your thumb and put your thumb in the middle and your fingers around like this, your brain would be in your head like this. Here's your cortex where you do your thinking and other stuff. Here's your limbic area, which has the hippocampus. Here's your brainstem, which has the fight, flight, freeze, and faint response. And implicit memory is embedded throughout the brain. But the hippocampus here in the limbic area has got to tie all those puzzle pieces. They're like puzzle pieces together to assemble a whole picture of the assembled jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, a couple of things happen. On the left side of the brain, especially, you have factual memory. On the right side of the brain, the hippocampus establishes what's called autobiographical memory, which is, I was in Vietnam in 1972, and this is what happened to me and my unfortunate buddy who had these horrible things. 
that preceded the ending of his life. Um, and those would be tagged with a feeling, as I'm recalling this, I know this happened to me in the past, and I know it's coming from a memory. Or, that's autobiographical, I could just have the fact of it. I know, as a feeling from the past, the fact my buddy was killed. Mm -hmm. So, whether it's factual, explicit memory on the left, or the one that's dominant on the right is autobiographical, explicit memory, they're both tagged with the feeling of I'm remembering. Mm -hmm. And they're also the gateway to narrative. That is, it's a, another layer of our human process mediated more by the, the prefrontal cortex of the brain, this part right behind your forehead, that basically says, what's the meaning of these memories? What does it mean for my life? What happened? Did I, did I betray my friend? Could I have been a better friend and soldier to have protected him so he wouldn't be dead now? What do I do with my guilt and shame about the fact that my buddy died and he died in such a horrible way? <clears throat> the feeling is so terrible inside of me. I can't even put words to it, mm -hmm. but I need to. I need to tell the story of what happened. So mm. narrative is crucial for resolving trauma, and it depends on explicit memory, harnessing the power of the hippocampus to integrate the implicit layers. Mm. So unresolved trauma, amazingly, this was what I suggested back in the 80s, but we didn't have the data to, to show it was true. We couldn't look at the brain. In the 90s, we could find the look in the brain, and it turns out one of the key places that post-traumatic stress disorder impacts the brain is the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. right, you could right. kind of, well, I could. You could guess that by, by, the, by, by creating the, the visual image that what would happen if, let's say, you could understand post-traumatic stress disorder in this way. I'm in Vietnam. Let's, I'll be that soldier. I'm with my buddy, we're doing our best to protect each other, protect ourselves, and then, you know, as luck would have it, even if I do nothing wrong and I've done everything a good soldier should do, he gets the initial bullet, he falls over, he can't protect himself, and then they get him, and I'm watching this from another bush, and I, there's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely nothing I can do, and I watch him being, anyway, horribly tortured and killed. So... Um, I see all this and I feel like it's my fault. The amount of a, a stress hormone called cortisol that would be secreted with that experience is so huge and there are receptors on the hippocampus in particular that are cortisol receptors that will bind to the cortisol and will do two things. They will shut the hippocampus off in that moment and in the long run, they will actually destroy part of the hippocampus. And that's why you see in PTSD, it's actually shrunken. Huh. So the sensitivity of cortisol receptors in the hippocampus to cortisol levels can explain the impairment of explicit processing <coughs> of a traumatic memory. And then to add insult to injury, another set of chemicals that's released with a trauma. So one is the stress hormone, cortisol shuts down the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. The other hormone, of course, is adrenaline. Right. I'm pumping out adrenaline. Now what adrenaline does, it doesn't affect the hippocampus. What it does, it affects implicit encoding and strengthens the sense of fear I feel that through my amygdala, this part of the limbic area next to the hippocampus, it will strengthen the visual imagery of my friend being tortured and, 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 and killed as he was, it will strengthen the sounds. So, mm. you know, adrenaline deepens the encoding and therefore the storage of implicit memory, but cortisol shuts off the hippocampus, which would allow me to integrate implicit memory into pictures I can deal with, facts, autobiographical experience, and then make a narrative out of those explicit memories. So right. in a sense, what I've done is I've, I've, as a soldier, as I've done the best I could, but my brain's cortisol secretion, shutting off my hippocampus, my adrenaline, raising the encoding, intensifying the encoding of implicit memory, makes me a setup for PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. 
can be explained in large part by what I've just described. Wow. And now my own impaired system floods me with chaotic images that feel like they're happening in the present. That's a flashback. And I shut down to try to just adapt. Mm -hmm. So I have the rigidity of shutting down to protect myself. I have the chaos of this flooding of implicit only memories that are now intruding on my consciousness. And I don't know about any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it just floods me. And it is absolutely terrifying. And I feel terrified, helpless, guilty, ashamed, and now I come back to the States. Mm. Wow. So your that description here is so powerful. And the way you've described this, I think many probably can relate to the feelings that you described. What was the journey with that specific individual in terms of helping them heal? I mean, is this, are we talking, yeah. you know, is it, uh, you know, something that has to be done within, within the construct of a very medical uh, framework or is, or, or is there healing potential for like in-home exercises that can be done apart from therapy? And I mean, I, how, how far are we going in terms of the journey of healing for someone like that? Yeah. Well, now in his particular case, unfortunately I was a young resident and, um, uh, he had planted live grenades around the VA, the VA grounds. And so he was, we were an open ward so he was transferred to a closed ward where I wasn't working. So, yeah. uh, you know, but in, in patients like him, I can tell you who I was able to treat later on. And of course, in lots of cases that people talk about of treating PTSD, unresolved trauma that we call post-traumatic stress disorder is resolvable. Hmm. And there are lots of ways to do it. There's um, somatic experiencing, sensory motor things, uh, treatments. These are body-based treatments. There's EMDR, which some people don't like, but a lot of studies show works very well. Um, there, are, there are treatments that are actually quite palatable. That is, you don't have to be flooded with an overwhelming experience of shoving this in someone's face where you, there's a lot of dropout from therapy. Mm -hmm. There are therapies that basically do this. They teach you to develop the resources you need. I would call them mindset skills. That would be my, for my framework. Mm -hmm. To be able to have a stronger kind of consciousness that then could say, oh, wow, that was just an implicit reactivation. It was terrifying. I'm mm -hmm. filled with shame. I feel like I betrayed my friend. But those are feelings among a lot of feelings I have. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you develop a mindset skill, what it means is you are strengthening consciousness and then inviting in a kind of bring it on stance resources to be developed that then allow you to have a safe haven to return to. So as you begin to go through the important and many would say necessary activation of unintegrated implicit memory, it needs to go through awareness. It may not all need to be articulated with words, but it needs to go through your awareness. And amazingly, the experience of activating an implicit memory into consciousness. So you're retrieving an implicit memory. A part of you will feel like, oh my God, this is happening in the present moment. But once you've developed your resources, you see, another part of you will say, aha, the feeling this is happening in the present moment is because this is connected to an unintegrated implicit memory of when I was on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. Now I understand that. Now, it's going to be frightening and terrifying and feeling ashamed and all that stuff, yes. But at the same time, you're going to have this other awareness. It's often helpful to have a therapist who can be with you on that journey. Mm -hmm. It's not always necessary, but it's usually a really good idea to go on that journey because the therapist will help you with what's called the dual focus of attention. What's the two? Dual means two. Focus attention means streaming energy. One focus is on the fact that you are a survivor, you are no longer on the battlefield, you made it, and here you are. Mm -hmm. And you're right now either with yourself, if you're doing it on your own, or with a therapist. The other focus of attention invites the implicit memory into consciousness and says consciousness is the portal for change. It's where we get choice. It's where we lead to integration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And in right. fact, here's the secret. Consciousness activates the hippocampus. 
So even though you may not have used your hippocampus in the battlefield because of the cortisol secretion, now with the dual focus, you let the implicit memories be activated with your other focus that you've developed with resource development. You say, I can stay present in consciousness and I can now have my hippocampus not be flooded and overwhelmed and shut down. I can now, now allow my hippocampus to process memories even from 30 years ago, hmm. right? Yeah. And yeah. there they then change the way they're forming because here's the secret of the whole thing. As my research mentor, Bob Bjork, B-J-O-R-K would say, memory retrieval can be a memory modifier. So as you retrieve implicit memory with this healing integrative stance, not just a flashback, which can be repeatedly traumatizing, but you can actually take these implicit memories and then integrate them with the hippocampus, make them facts and autobiographical details, and then really work on a deep narrative that makes sense of it all. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just thinking of the listener right now who is maybe asking the question, maybe they're the caregiver to someone who's dealing with this or they're experiencing the trauma that you've described. Is there anything that, and, and, and I'm just thinking the one who's maybe not connected to that mental health field uh, as it relates to a counselor, are there, are there certain things that they could do more on a home base uh, kind of exercises that would help them relieve some of the, the fear and the, the shame, the guilt, the, th the things that you're talking about on an emotional level, uh, or is that kind of outside of the realm of possibility? Uh, yeah, well, here's a couple of things to think about. I mean, the place to begin is to say the goal is integration. Mm -hmm. And integration needs you to develop uh, what are called resourcing skills. Okay. What does that mean? It means if I get flooded with an emotion, I need to develop the strength, the skill, the technique, the tool to bring myself from either being chaotic or rigid into a more harmonious flow. Okay. So let's say, let's say I was the fellow in that terrible accident with my well, accident, that, that, that injury. My, my friend died and I was... Yeah. Uh, Right. Um, battlefield with him. Yep. I may need a therapist. Let's just be clear. I really may need a therapist to mm -hmm. do the deep work, especially if it involves shame and guilt and that I betrayed my friend. That's that's a relational issue that needs to be worked on. So we want we don't want to just say, oh, anyone can do anything on their own because sometimes you really need a therapist. Yeah. But short of that or in between, here are some things just to think about. One is that you need to develop these resources. So doing um, forms of reflective practice, strengthen your ability to focus attention. I have a practice on our website, drdansiegel.com, the wheel of awareness. It's not instead of therapy by any means, right. but it's a way of strengthening your access to consciousness and being open to whatever's on this kind of rim of awareness that you, you have. So those would be things that where you develop your resources. Now, journal writing is another way to actually develop a, a pathway towards integration. And these, again, are not instead of therapy. If you right. need therapy, please, fine. Sure. Uh, but these are things you can do. You can do these reflective practices, like the wheel. You can start writing in a journal. And what I would do is I would outline, just from what our talk is today, Noel, on one side of a sheet of paper, implicit memories. Hmm. Put a line. Explicit memory. Put a line. Narrative understanding. Hmm. So if I were writing this out for this fellow, or if I were that fellow, I might write, um, you know, uh, fear of, you know, bushes, if I was in a bush, right? Right. Uh, terror about the rain. Uh, startles at loud sounds, you know, the, the, yep. the guns going off. Um, and that's all I'm doing. I'm just writing out what those free-floating things that intrude on me all the time are. Then I put a line and I go, wow, what is the fact of that? Well, the fact was my best friend was killed next to me in a horrible way when I was in Vietnam. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Now, if I wanted to go there, I could then do, that was factual explicit memory. I do autobiographical. go, I remember March 18th, 1972, I was with Joey 
and, da, 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 and I go, and now I'm writing the myself in a certain time. Mm-hmm. Now, as I do that, I may get all sorts of emotions that are implicit that come up, and I could write those out. Right. But the idea is just the act of journal writing means you're not in Vietnam. Hmm. So that's the dual focus yep. you're doing. And then the narrative side of that little chart you're writing is what's the meaning in my life of these memories? The meaning is my brother used to always say I was a wimp. But then I got taller than him and I joined the forces to show him I wasn't a wimp. But then my best friend from boot camp, Joey, and I went to Vietnam. We were ready to take on the world and I couldn't save him. And now I'm crying. Mm-hmm. convulsing all these implicit memories keep on coming in so I go back and I say here's the implicit memory so a part of my mind see this is the amazing thing about the mind one part of your mind can be having a little bit of a distance like an observer I call it owning an experience observing O witnessing W and narrating N mm. so for you to own an unresolved experience you got to observe, witness, and narrate, not just be flooded by implicit memories as if you're back there. Right, right. So this is the secret, that the actual process of owning the experience, observing, witnessing, and narrating, gives you the capacity then to activate your hippocampus to create factual and autobiographical memory from these implicit floodings, have the dual focus there, feel the feelings in your body, but also be narrating. And then as you do that, I think you'll find, and the studies support this, All sorts of positive changes, even in your immune system, the way your cardiovascular system works, your mind will feel clearer. Mm -hmm. As you do this, you may feel so ashamed that your brother said you were a wimp, that you couldn't protect Joey, that you just can't get over that. And you absolutely need to have a therapist who can reassure you that from their point of view, there was absolutely nothing any human being could have done in the theater of war like that. Yeah. And you need to learn what's called self-compassion, how to forgive yourself for these crimes you think you committed and to allow yourself to bring love to yourself, just like if the same had happened with Joey as his best friend, you would want him to be kind to himself. Self-compassion is about becoming your own best friend. Hmm. And a lot of times when we've been through trauma that's unresolved, we just aren't our own best friend. Yeah. Let me uh, maybe take us a little bit down another path here. Um, you, you talk about in your book, The Triangle of Well-Being. And yes. I don't know if this relates to what we were just talking about. How does that relate to this mindset? Yeah. Well, The Triangle of Well-Being is basically if you make a triangle and you put um, relationships on one point, brain on another point, and mind on another point, then what you come up with is um, the idea that relationships are how we share energy and information flow with each other. The brain is the embodied mechanism of that flow and the mind beyond subjective experience and non-conscious information processing and conscious information processing beyond those is self-organization. Then you realize when this is a triangle of well-being, all those things are promoting integration. They're promoting the linkage of differentiated parts. So if we take the example I just gave of that fellow who's friends with Joey, you know, he was differentiating the different elements of implicit memory and then linking them within factual and autobiographical explicit memory and then linking them even further with narrative, hmm. with making sense, with finding meaning yeah. out of the madness. Yeah. So, you know, this is an example where mind sight is insight into oneself, empathy for others and integration. And this is where, exactly like you're saying, Noel, you know, the, the triangle of well-being is, in a sense, you know, how in a practical way do we try to promote integration in our whole body, you know, including the brain. We're just using the word brain as a term for the whole body experience of the mind, but also in our relationships. So for this fellow, you know, or other patients I've worked with, you know, the key thing for a therapist is to make sure you're honoring differences, promoting linkages in the therapy but let's say I was married, um, there are a number of things that can challenge a close, intimate relationship for someone coming back from the, from the theater of war. Um, and I don't want to forget to say that these days with the, the, the explosives that are there, even if I was wearing my helmet, I can have this sheer effect 
on the fibers in my brain that have a lot to do with regulation and self-organization. Mm-hmm. So I may need to do EEG biofeedback. I may need to do, do a lot of mindfulness meditation to try to grow the fibers in the brain that have been stretched and are inflamed from my literally my head injury. Yeah. Even if I'm wearing a helmet. And is that some of the things that you had just mentioned, like journaling? Are those some of the ways that you grow back those fibers or are those they different? Would too, those would be good too, though I'd really want, if someone's had a particular brain injury, I'd want to really turn towards some of the really exciting new findings they're doing with um, uh, not just mindfulness meditation. That for sure is exciting. Yeah. Uh, but there are certain things they're, they're doing to actually help the brain heal when it's inflamed and to grow... Um, new synaptic connections, maybe even new neurons from the hippocampus, but certainly new connections. And so I wouldn't want to just do journal writing. These days, they're, they're interesting things, even like with putting a light on the surface of the scalp. There's some suggestion that we can increase what's called neuroplasticity. So you really want to make sure you're getting the most cutting edge ways of neuroplasticity is basically how experience can make the brain grow in healthy ways and what we're talking about is growing in integrative ways so that I'll just give you a little example in our hand model this area behind the forehead is the area that gets most challenged with 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 traumatic brain injury yeah and you often can see TBI traumatic brain injury with PTSD you know these impacts of I think cortisol on the hippocampus and this free floating implicit memory so those two things often go together so the difficulty here would be If my prefrontal cortex has been sheared by the movement of my head um, or even a direct hit to my head, um, that shearing can make it so these fibers, which are basically linking the higher part of the brain, the cortex, with the limbic area, with the brainstem, and even the whole body and the social world, so five differentiated regions of information flow, the social world, so how I'm dealing with my wife, let's say, my body, the signals from my heart and lungs, coming up through my spinal cord here, my brainstem where I've got my fight, flight, freeze, and faint response, my limbic area, which is doing all sorts of things, including those layers of memory, and my cortex where I'm doing my thinking and planning. Hmm. This is the area that ties it all together, coordinates and balances. So if it's been sheared, you know, maybe under easygoing conditions, I'm okay, but a little bit of stress, if I'm tired, if I haven't eaten, if there's something irritating going on at home, if I'm just feeling impatient, all sorts of things can make it so I flip my lid and I lose the coordination and balance of those five things. I can go into fight mode, flee mode, freeze mode, faint mode, where I collapse. Um, you know, I can release all sorts of things that when I'm together, I'm like this. But flipping my lid would be literally seen as losing the integrative functioning of this prefrontal cortex. So we want to really be kind to our personnel that are coming back from war Mm -hmm. because whether it's TBI, traumatic brain injury or, and, or, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, these are all challenges to self-regulation, which Mm -hmm. is what self-organization is. And so we want to help each other as a community, but support soldiers coming back so that we can give them the most cutting edge ways of healing the brain whether it's PTSD or TBI, and allowing integration to grow. Because the good news is, is that no matter how old you are, or even how long ago the trauma was, this impaired integration that's either part of TBI or part of PTSD can be focused upon, can be detected, can be then brought into a setting. Often it's a therapeutic setting. But you can do these in- integrative things on your own, too. And you can grow these integrative fibers. This is the beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. Once we name it, we can train it. Hmm. Once we can tame it, if it's out of control, we can train it if it's, if it's just being uh, stretched literally to its, its limit and can't function well. And we need to be really respectful of, of these ways that the brain can be challenged in how it functions. So... Let me ask the question, um, and I, I know I'm, we're getting here. Uh, I want to make sure I get these questions from our audience, but yes. I'm just thinking about rewiring the brain. I think that's what you're talking about in some ways, this ability that we have to be able to do that when there's been trauma. And I, I, I know we've been focused on more of the 
um, trauma specific to military. Maybe uh, a closing story here as it relates to rewiring the brain. I know that you've worked with a lot of folks that have mental illness apart from military. Can you use a, a story, a, a case study around how that rewiring the brain works? Sure, absolutely. Um, I'll talk about a person I talk about in Mindsight, um, uh, this fellow Jonathan, who was a 16-year-old boy who had very um, unstable moods. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't traumatized as a kid, uh, but he did inherit um, this tendency for unstable moods. Now, I had a feeling he had the beginnings of what's called manic depressive illness, otherwise known as bipolar illness. Right. But just to be sure, I sent him to not just one, but two other board certified adolescent psychiatrists. And they, like me, felt the same way that they, um, he probably had the beginnings of bipolar disorder. Now, it's a very dangerous disorder untreated. It has a high mortality rate from suicide. Mm -hmm. So it's serious, but his parents refused to give him medications, which were the, the uh, common treatment at the time. I was learning to do reflective practices in more depth and I was studying them. And there was some hint that you might be able to grow integrative fibers that seemed to me to be deficient in manic depressive illness. Um, and with the parents and uh, Jonathan's consent, with very close monitoring of his suicidal thinking, you know, because it's a really precarious thing to do. So I'm not recommending this as an outpatient. It's very hard to do. Sure. But, but in this situation, everyone was on board. We would take it week by week and see how it went. And basically, if you read in that chapter of the book, he learned to do a reflective practice called the Wheel of Awareness, where the idea was you would develop this spaciousness of consciousness so that when his irritable mood would fill him and he could see him reacting to his parents or his friends with irritability or even toward himself, he'd, he'd expand consciousness enough so he could actually have a kind of observing, witnessing, narrating capacity. Oh, my mood is going south. That This is going down. I must be in a funky mood. I'll give myself some space. Maybe I won't go to this party tonight. I'll just say to my parents, instead of all these expletives he would say to them, he could say to them, you know, give me some space. I'm in a bad mood. Let me pull myself out of it. And an hour later with some meditation, his internal reflection, doing the wheel, he could get this sanctuary of, if you imagine this wheel with an outer rim and a center hub, the hub is the knowing of consciousness. The rim is just the gnomes, like what mood you're in. Mm -hmm. So instead of the mood taking him over, because he had expanded this hub of his wheel, um, he was able to then say, you know something, I'll give myself a little break, I'll go exercise, I'll rest, I'll do whatever the different things, depending on his mood, he needed to do. And then he can go back and return to interacting with his friends or his parents. And over time, this skill of observing, witnessing, and narrating, of owning the experience, allowed him, even though the moods could continue over time, to not have them take him over. So if you think about it this way, if he was in a funky mood and the mood took him over, he would start acting with people who in turn would send back to him signals of disgust at him and irritation, which of course would make his mood worse. Mm -hmm. So now he could sense the mood, say it to his parents, give me a break, not get that action, reaction and actions from them, calm himself down, because this is where the resourcing happens, bring himself back to a more balanced place, re-engage with his parents, and then the self-reinforcing positive thing was he could see that he was in control. So instead of the natural course for bipolar disorder, which is you don't have the spaciousness of the hub, your hub is very small, the mood takes you over, you interact with other people who react to you, you react to them, they react to you, your mood gets worse and worse and worse, mm. your feeling toward yourself is I'm completely out of control. The next time the mood surfaces, you say I'm out of control, you hide, it takes over, and that's your whole life. Wow. wow. And when you look at the parts of the brain that actually are deficient in bipolar disorder, it's from this prefrontal cortex, especially on the right side, down to the amygdala, which helps govern our mood in part. And so what studies show is that this kind of reflective practice and formal mindfulness practice 
can grow these prefrontal fibers. So if you had to summarize what meditation, mindfulness meditation can do, it grows integrative fibers. Mindfulness meditation makes the brain more interconnected. Those are studies of what's called a connectome. And mindfulness meditation grows prefrontal fibers that help regulate emotion. Mindfulness grows the connections between the left and right. Mindfulness even grows the hippocampus. Wow. So this wow. is the cool thing. You don't need a fancy gadget. Sometimes you do if you had TBI and you want to help right. promote neuroplasticity. But here are the things that help promote neuroplasticity. Good sleep. Good exercise. A balanced diet. Good relationships. And when I say good, I mean connecting relationships with people that support you. And when you have these things in your life, then you do your focused training, whether it's mindfulness or EEG feedback or some form of therapy that focuses on the feelings in your body, recognizes the nature of unresolved trauma, especially limitations and potentialities for traumatic brain in injury, TBI. What you want to do is get yourself with a clinician, if you're doing clinical work, who understands these things, if you're doing your own work, you want to be able to develop this wheel of awareness kind of practice of opening the hub of your mind. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to see that you can determine how your non-integrated brain, because if you have unresolved trauma or even TBI, integration is impaired. The good news is you can intentionally grow your brain fibers to make your brain more integrated and your mind healthier and your life more fulfilling. Wow. <laughs> I'll tell you, this is, uh, I, I, just ha I get the sense that as people are listening to this, there's a lot of hope because I think in this area, especially around mental illness and TBI or PTSD, there's so much that it's, you're just dealing with what you have and it's kind of like just get by and that's the best we can offer. And I feel like what you've just shared with our audience is that, yeah, there's that component, but there's actually hope to, to regain what's been lost here. And I think that's exciting. And, um, I, I, I gosh, I have so much respect for you, Dr. Siegel and, and the work that you're doing. It's groundbreaking, quite honestly, uh, in terms it's of what's going on I here. hope it's of help. I really, yeah. and, uh, I hope your well, listeners are really, uh, find it useful and practical. Yeah. And I'd love to just, I got three questions from our audience that sure. would, they would love to get your perspective on this. Uh, Emily from joint base, Lewis McCord, actually in Washington, she wrote in and said, my husband returned from Afghanistan two months ago. He is so angry and irritable towards me at all time. But whenever I mention that he or we should go talk to a professional, he gets really mad and shuts me down. I know I can't force him to get help, but what can I do to encourage him or help him? Well, Emily, yeah? Yes, Emily. Uh, you know, Emily, the, it's a really important question you're asking, and it's the starting place, isn't it, to, uh, to help people. Um, I'll just reflect with you this, that, you know, part of the challenge, I think, is that when people come back from a trauma, let's say from Afghanistan, um, there's a feeling that they may have had there of being helpless, of not being as strong as they want to be or not being as in control as they wish they could have been. Now, no one could have been in control, perhaps, and anyone would have felt helpless, but this is just their experience. So the act of coming back home and being able to either volunteer that you need help or to accept someone else's suggestion that you need help in a way is saying, I can't do it on my own. Mm. I'm not strong enough to do it on my own or I'm not courageous enough to do it on my own or something like that. That's a very common thought that people have. So maybe if your husband watches this recording, um, he'll get a different feeling because what I found is when you go to the brain and explain the brain mechanisms of unresolved trauma, people who have very understandably issues of shame and feeling helpless and wanting to be in control see that it's not their fault, but it is their responsibility to get help. Now that may sound like a subtle distinction, Going to the brain isn't an excuse, it's an explanation. Mm -hmm. And what I've found as a, as a clinician, even as just my own personal life, is that when I understand the mechanisms in the brain, I can actually be kinder to myself. And I can realize, okay, I'm a human being in a body. No matter what my ideas are of not needing help or having to be strong, I'm a human being in a body. 
And the body has all sorts of things happen to it in life. And so maybe if he can see it that way, mm-hmm. he'll, he'll be able to understand that it's actually an act of courage to acknowledge your vulnerabilities. I was in Afghanistan and I got injured. Or I've been in Afghanistan and I have some leftover stuff, so I'm irritable and angry now. It's actually an act of courage and strength to say, you know something? I'm a human being and I acknowledge my humanity. And in that, I know that I need to get support. Mm. Getting support is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Feeling something is not a sign of being a, a wimp. It's a sign of being human. So once we get to that place, then there's movement to go forward. Unfortunately, the feelings that are there of being vulnerable, of being frightened, of being terrified, of feeling helpless, of feeling ashamed, of feeling like you may have betrayed people, those are huge, huge, huge feelings. And so we want to name them so we can tame them. We want to acknowledge that they're there because being strong means accepting exactly what's going on and being in touch with your feelings, not becoming someone who's just covering up their feelings and getting angry at everyone around you the people you love you the most, you can get the most irritated with and angry with, that's not a way to live a healthy life. And so strength is really seeking help to come back to connection, not always disconnecting from people who love you. That's really good. Uh, Let me move on to the next one. This is from Carl from Oklahoma City. He writes in, My wife has been really moody and reclusive lately. She has received treatment both medicine and counseling for depression, but it doesn't seem to be working this time. Are there any at-home exercises that she can do to help her get back to normal self, to her uh, normal self? Was your wife uh, in uh, overseas or? or yes. she... No, not overseas. Doesn't say. Okay. No. So in general, you know, it's interesting. Um, you're pointing out, and, and who's the, what's the person's name again? Uh, Carl. Carl. Carl, you're pointing out that, you know, um, there are different ways of doing treatment. There's psychotherapy for moodiness and depression. There's medications for moodiness and depression. There's EEG feedback for that. One study that came out um, from Georgia showed that if you have depression without a history of a difficult childhood, then medications are really pretty good. If you've had a difficult childhood then medications by themselves are actually not going to do much and you need psychotherapy treatment uh, for the issues related to your childhood. Mm. Very important study to tease that apart. Mm. So if someone is not getting better, it can be something like getting the right medication or it can be getting the right uh, you know, therapy. So it really depends on what's going on. There's a beautiful book by Siegel, Williams, and Teasdale, not me, but Mm S-E-G-A-L, called The Mindful Way Through Depression Workbook. Mm -hmm. And I found that book to be just absolutely accessible and beautiful. And if you wanted to start with a home program, uh, I would recommend that research-based program. It comes with a, a CD and everything where you can listen to reflective practices. But you have to be careful, you know, make sure someone's not self-injurious or suicidal. And you want to make sure that they're with a, a clinician who can really be thinking about, well, what we've been trying this way didn't work. Let's pivot and change strategies. That's the kind of therapist you want. Yeah. And so uh, you want to make sure you're with the right therapist also. Yeah. But I would recommend that workbook too. Yeah. And and just so the audience knows, we'll have that uh resource that you just mentioned linked right below here so that people can find it easily. Fantastic. Final question is Sherry S from Reno. She writes in, it's difficult for me to ascertain whether or not my nine year old is struggling with depression or if it's just normal anxiety. He changed schools and, uh, and was, uh, express it expressively excited about it for the first couple of months. But now he has had daily stomach pain and seemed glum for the past month. Should I get him professional help? His pediatrician cannot find a health source, uh, find a health source of his stomach pain, and his grandmother says it will take just time for him to adjust. I want to help him, however I can. This is Sherry. Sherry, yes. Yeah, Sherry. Thanks for your question. Um, you know, in, in child psychiatry, what we want to do is look at the big picture. 
and so, you know, if a child has been assessed by a pediatrician who has found nothing wrong with his stomach, assuming he doesn't have gluten sensitivity or something like that, that some pediatricians don't even check into. So you want to uh, watch for that because that, that can be an issue. Um, and, and also assuming that he hasn't been on antibiotics a lot for some other issue uh, and that he's got enough probiotics going, that can be a source of stomach problems. I used to be in pediatrics, you can tell. Mm -hmm. um, you want to make sure those things have all been ruled out. Uh, and so you can talk to your pediatrician about that. Um, now, in terms of the psychiatric side of it, you know, sometimes for a nine-year-old, um, he can be, if he's in uh, fourth grade, third or fourth grade, uh, depending on where he is and what kind right, of school right. he's in, um, you know, school work, academic work can start getting harder at this time. And you want to make sure that he doesn't have some kind of sensory issue, like needing glasses, for example, or needing eye training if he has something called vertical phoria, where one eye looks above the other, or there are all sorts of reasons why up close work that's being done a lot more in fourth grade, um, you know, or even fifth grade can, can feel challenging. When you feel like you're not able to hold your own at school, uh, you start getting stomach aches and all sorts of manifestations of anxiety, rather than saying, mom, I'm having difficulty with the reading assignments because my eyes are not working really well or I can't pay attention or, or I can't process language or whatever the things are. So if it becomes clear that his stomach ache is because he doesn't like the academic at school and you know he's not being bullied or harassed or mistreated either by other kids or by adults at school, and that's an important thing to ask him about sure. and really watch his response because um, those things can lead to a stomach ache too then you really do need to get them assessed uh, to make sure you're not missing something. And I, I've had a number of kids where, you know, the, the, the standard examination of their eyes missed this thing called vertical phoria. Uh, they have an incredibly difficult time at school. Uh, the pediatricians, we're, and pediatrics, we're not trained to assess for it. We do the long distance view of can you see these letters or not. Mm -hmm. So you want a developmentally oriented optometrist who can literally assess um, not just um, you know, sight, which is being able to see those letters, but vision, the visual system is how you have to move your eyes inward when you focus on letters on a page and then move them down the page. And that's a pretty sophisticated set of muscular movements. And if the muscles are just anatomically a little off, like for example, they are in me, um, you just can't do it. Uh, it's just really, really hard to do academic work and you get a stomachache. So you just want to make sure you're not missing something. So as a parent, Sherry, I wouldn't worry like, oh my God, this is a terrible thing for my kid. I would more say something is challenging him. I don't know what it is. You know, most kids don't have stomach aches before they go to school. They really like school. So let me figure out what it is in particular going on for my son and then help him out with it. Yeah, yeah so, good. so good. Dr. Siegel, thank you so much for the time that you spent with us and our audience. Uh, again, what we've been talking about is Mindsight, the new science of personal transformation and really the integration between our brain and our feelings. I mean, you've done such a guy. I don't even want to try to attempt to regurgitate what you just shared. So make sure people uh, tune in and listen. But if you want to know more, uh, I want to just throw out there. You, you said it was uh, Dr. Siegel or yeah, Dan Dr. Siegel. D-R-D-A-N. S I E G E L, Dr. Dan Siegel.com. Dot com. Just uh, a wealth of information at his uh, website and certainly pick up the book. Uh, but again, thank you for the groundbreaking work that you've been. I and mean, this is your life work. Yeah. It's been amazing. Thank you very much, Noel. Thanks for the great work you do. All right. Take care. You too. Bye bye. Bye.